Welcome to the Marshall Pruitt Podcast presented by Cooper Tires. Welcome to the 300th episode as well. I wanted to save this number for uh, something meaningful, at least meaningful to me. I've been trying to connect for the past couple of weeks with my friend and former speed colleague, David Hobbs, who's awesome, truly awesome new autobiography, Hobbo, Motor Racer, Motor Mouth, is out and just about, kind of, sort of, in people's hands here in North America. And uh, again, knowing that David's pretty amazing life and career has finally made it into print, a really a large and information-packed and uh, anecdote-filled autobiography, I hope you enjoy it because I have absolutely loved it. So if you're familiar with David's work, not only as a driver, but especially a 40-year career in television, you know that David's one of one, truly one of a kind. And so usually David does his work as the title of the autobiography uh, foretells with his mouth. And I can say that sitting in front of a typewriter, because that is indeed what was used, and also uh, Microsoft Word, which is a modern invention he has recently embraced, David's skill in speaking into a microphone also translates over to the keyboard. And uh, so, didn't want to obviously give away the entire book and tell all the great tales, but we did start off with just what it took to get this done, because it has been in the works for a while. And so, uh, we do open for a little bit there as he runs us through the attempts and efforts to get this into print. And then we spend some time just talking through some of the major highlights that are captured. Uh, family playing a very important role in the launch and support of his young career. And uh, there's also a few uh, few great tales in there about Le Mans and uh, maybe him setting straight my romantic perceptions of what it was like back in the 60s and 70s where he raced four GTs and Porsches and you name it. A uh, great tale of driving into the south with the amazing, legendary Jim Clark. And uh, there's some fun to be told there. And then just some of the other uh, interesting, strange uh, successes, failures, you name it, things that he encountered. One thing you will hear both in the conversation, but definitely in his book, David's driven everything uh, through racing's greatest eras. Uh, this is someone who has... Instead of being someone who stuck with one team, had an opportunity to be a lifelong employee or relatively few team changes, David was a mercenary and uh, went from team to team, car to car. That's what his career ended up being. Really amazing to understand how much driving David did. The fact that he's still alive to tell the story and put together an autobiography with two friends of his. So hope you enjoyed a little conversation here. And as his book becomes readily available through Amazon.com and other specialist motor racing memorabilia stores, I think you're going to enjoy putting this one into your collection. You know you can get every episode of the Marshall Pruitt Podcast on iTunes, also on Podbean, which is our host for everything, uh, on the Marshall Pruitt Podcast Facebook page. And I'm also in the midst of getting the podcast up onto Spotify. And it's going to be available on YouTube as well. So just simply an audio version uh, being played out through the YouTube video format. And that appears to be something that smarter podcasters than I have been doing for a while. So trying to reach out, branch out, and as always, would greatly appreciate your help in sharing, retweeting, forwarding, doing something with our little podcast to help grow our base. All right, off we go with my friend David Hobbs and Hobbo. Motor Racer, Motor Mouth. Mr. Hobbs, I am staring at more than 300 pages of just a raging ego on display. Good Lord, man. You decided it's autobiography time and you used up all the trees in the forest. Um, all kidding aside, mate, I have to admit, I think I'm one of many people who was seriously looking forward to your autobiography. And uh, now that we have Hobbo... Uh, in our hands, uh, and I guess more and more issues are coming over here to the U.S. Hopefully folks will be adding them to their bookshelves. Hobbo, Motor Racer, Motor Mouth, the autobiography of David Hobbs. Uh, this is a delightful piece of work, my friend. Before we get into some of the chapters and some of the fun tales and such, 
what what inspired this inside of you because this was never going to be a short and quick project once it got started well <laughs> you know I've, over the years um i've always been a bit of a motor mouth and even when i was a kid you know um starting out in my mum's morris oxford um a guy a, a, who was a commentator he was the PA commentator at Silverstone and he was a huge racing fan and he was also a top executive at GK Nettle GKN Mm. uh, in England Um, and he had this plan and he used to take us and right from the almost the beginning maybe the second year when I was racing Dad's Jag he, um, he put together these little forums and we'd go to pubs in England, um, you know, not very big pubs. And I'm not sure how he publicized these, but there'd be me and uh, a couple of other guys, uh, you know, club racers, um, and we would go and he would be the, the Q&A guy. Um, and they were very successful. We always had a good turnout. You know, I mean, like 30, 40, maybe 50 people in an English pub, all guzzling beer, mm-hmm. me included. Um, and Keith Douglas, who was the, the guy who put this all on, was a very good, um, he was very adept to speech. You know, he, he was good. And he, he would ask good questions and we'd all reply and uh, we'd all have our little stories to tell. And I always used to make a good story up. Um, don't let the facts get in the way of, you know, fiction. Um, and I've always been like that. And, you know, as time went on and I became a professional driver, you know, I've often talked to motor clubs, started off, start off in England, but over here, you know, Porsche clubs, BMW clubs, Ferrari clubs, all that sort of thing. And I've always told stories. Um, I don't have anything written down at all. Uh, nothing, you know, I just sort of wing it um, and hope to have it work. It's always worked so far. I suppose I always say to my wife, I suppose one of these days I'm going to stand up and be completely speechless and not know what to say, but... Um, and you know and after a lot of these tours a lot of people said well you got to write a book you got to write a book and they've been saying that for about 30 years so about 20 years ago I uh, decided to have a go um, and I you know got the old uh, typewriter out and uh, you know just stared at a blank sheet of paper and realised that I, I just you know I could verbalise this stuff but I couldn't just write it down and uh, so I started with Bob Varsha, who, of course, I'd worked with already by then for about 10 years. Yeah, of course. And uh, we put it, you know, on tape, and then Bob tried to get one of those transcribing, automatic transcribers, you know, where you plug it in and... They never work properly. Talk, and, yeah, and they, they never they work. Don't work they, well, they don't work the damn. So then he started to transcribe it, and, and we pl- plugged away for a couple of years, this doing, you know, hotel rooms and in various studios, wherever we were or whatever, you know. Um, and then it kind of went a bit fallow and then the publisher that we were going to use he had a, a bit of a bad spell as well and um, so it kind of took a, you know we've been doing this for about five years and nothing really happened and then I spoke to Andrew Marriott Yep. now Andrew Marriott of course as you know you've worked with Andrew Marriott on the TV and you've worked with Andrew Marriott on the radio Andrew is a very accomplished motorsports journalist and also very good on the TV um, now I have known Mar- uh, I have known Andrew obviously since we were both about 18 I wow. mean I started racing when I was 19 um, and Andrew was about the same age he might be a couple of years younger and he was a cub reporter for Autosports and Motoring News so some of my earlier exploits in Daz Jag and in the Low Elite in 1961. I mean, he was there. And he was not only there, he was writing about it. Brilliant. And has since become, you know, very much of a... Uh, he's sort of now one of the doyens of autosport uh, literature, you know. Um, and he's been everywhere and done everything, and he's written a lot of stuff himself. So Bob and I had a bit of a heart-to-heart, and Bob said, hey, you know, I know Andrew, you know, we've all worked with Andrew before, and he said, sure, you know, no skin off my nose. So we transferred it to Andrew, and um, 
around about that time, Mrs. Hobbs and I started coming down to uh, Florida for our winters from sunny Wisconsin. Yeah. Sunny, but extremely cold. Mm. Um, so Andrew came here two or three, two or three years. Ago. We kept thinking we'd get addicted, you know, get all done and dusted, and then. So this this has gone on for about another five or six years, and then again we were having trouble with a publisher, and um, Andrew suddenly pops up a couple of years ago and says, "Hey, look, you know, I found this Evro Publishing. They they do a lot of good stuff, and they're going to do Brian Redman's book." And they're good guys. The uh, Eric Verden Rowe, who owns that rope, used to own Haymarket, which he sold to uh, an American firm um, company. And um, so he approached that row and they said, sure, you would like to do that. Uh, so off we go again. And um, I went to... Um, the test with the NBC guys in Barcelona in January of 2016 and they said uh, no 2017 sorry and they said yep we'd like to publish a book and um, we'll we'll uh, launch it at the Media Island in 2018 <clears throat> so that's where we are and um, Mark Hughes not the Mark Hughes who writes for Motorsport, but another Mark Hughes who's a very accomplished writer, and uh, and he of course put the whole thing together after Mario after Andrew had given him the uh, transcript, and he put it together, mailed it over to me or emailed it over to me, and then I now I'm sitting down and reading it um, for the first time. I am seeing stuff that I didn't like, what of the change, and also it jogged, jogged the old memory bank. And so then, now I could use Word, which has taken me 78 years <laughs> to learn how to do it. Um, I could use Word, and so then I basically kind of just rehashed, not massive, but I think I added about eight or 9,000 words to it, um, good man, good man, and, and changed the way. But this was because I was now reading it. You know, put me in front of a blank sheet of paper, and my mind stays blank. Put me in front of it, and I just said, "Oh no, I don't like that. Oh, I didn't do it that way. No, that that wasn't that didn't come then. That came afterwards." And so I kind of rearranged it. Um, and the, well, obviously, um, they sent it away to be published. Um, they used to have all these books published in China. But apparently Evro have found um, some printers in East Germany, I think it is, um, hmm. which is obviously a hell of a lot quicker to just put on the train. So, you know, it's there and back in a couple of three weeks as opposed to six Sitting, weeks on the boat from China. Yeah, shipping, uh, shipping across. When the they ocean. say a slow boat from China, they mean a slow boat from China. Uh, so it's come out, but now we, we <laughs> the latest problem is we then launched it immediately on it in March, on March the 22nd. And I know on the March the 13th, rather, at the Amelia Island Concourse. And then the week after that, I sold some at Sebring. Um, and then that week, I went to England and we launched it at the RAC Club on March the 22nd in the UK. Um, but unfortunately, the books are still only just arriving here in the States mm -hmm. from the UK. There was some hold up with the shipping and uh, quarto books are uh, the wholesalers over here. Quarto is uh, a publisher and a wholesaler of books, a specialty book. Not, not certainly not just racing books, but all sorts of books. Um, and they're based up in Minnesota. And um, anyway, they've only. I, I gather that the books sort of arrived at the wholesaler today. Although I see that Amazon is still calling for the book to be available on May the 29th which seems a hell of a long time to go yet but um, it is here at last and uh, so one way or another <laughs> it has taken about 15 years to write this bloody book well let's dive into that's some the short of, version yeah that, that's the short version says David uh, let's dive into some of the uh, aspects of the book and I'll admit I'm just picking from some of the things that I loved uh 
among the, the various things that stood out to me, David, at least early on in uh, Habo, I really appreciated and, and got to learn quite a bit about how your introduction to racing was somewhat different than the tale we hear about many drivers who embark upon racing as a driver based on their singular passion. It's something I went and did on my own. This was very much a Hobbs family type introduction to motor racing and support structure for you. I found that to be really fascinating and unique. Dad was an inventor and he had invented an automatic transmission. And so we happened to have some vehicles at hand, which um, a lot of people, you know, didn't necessarily have. And I had a mechanic at hand because he had a small factory. He employed about eight people um, to help me. And, um, I mean, Dad and Mum came to very few races, unlike today when it really is a family affair. True, but well, back like my... then most families weren't saying why yes. Take no. one of our family vehicles and go compete, well, and or make you know yeah. making such things available. Uh, w that I think is what stood out as the rarity to me, at least. Well, of course, but it wasn't then. You know, uh, it, it it really wasn't rare in those days. That's how more or less we all started because there was no none of this massive go kart programming when we were all little. I mean, there wasn't go karts for kids. You couldn't race until you were old enough to have a driver's license, which in England meant 17, and you couldn't get a, a competition license until you had a road license. Yeah. So you couldn't you couldn't even think about racing until you were 17. Um, most 17 year olds didn't really think about racing. Um, I didn't really. I mean, I I had always been a or Sterling Moss had always been a hero of mine and Mike Hawthorns to a lesser degree, and then of course Jimmy Clark lurked out and uh, he became a hero of mine. Um, but I, um, yeah, but I mean, I mean, I drove the car to the race and hopefully drove it home. <laughs> well, of course, the very first race I went to, I didn't drive it home. I had to have it towed home. And of course, unlike today, where you put the thing on a flat truck or a flatbed and take it home. I mean, when I say towed it home, I towed it home on the end of a rope um, with a friend of mine's father. Um, and it was a long way. It was 120 miles of cross-country England little roads. So... It was not a pleasant trip. Um, and it was very rare for dads to buy their kids' cars. I mean, Richard Atwood started racing a standard 10, um, which was a small British car, um, pretty damn slow. Probably not as slow as my Morris Oxford, but nearly. Mm. Um, but then after a year or two of that, his dad bought him a Formula Junior. I mean, they bought a proper race car and they had a proper mechanic and a proper trailer to put it in. Um, I didn't do that until my third season when I had the load to leak. The first two seasons, you know, I drove the car to the races, usually drove it home, <laughs> although not always. And um, it wasn't until I raced the load to leak in 1961 that we actually had a trailer. And even then, I mean, when I say a trailer, I mean a little two-wheel trailer towed behind a Ford Zodiac um, shooting brake. So, um, you know, state car. Um, so, and it was just muckers that came along to help. You know, I didn't have any proper help. Um, and I was as green as grass. I mean, it took me <laughs> two years to use racing tires, for God's sake. You know, I was trying to race on Mission X, which were not the best race tires in the world. And that, um, that's another thing that uh, I, I appreciate. I don't think anyone will be surprised to learn that your autobiography, David, is filled with candor uh, with the written word. Another aspect that I appreciate about it is you've also uh, ensured plenty of candor and, and honesty is included through a very extensive photo archive uh, you have kept, whether it's uh, photos themselves or magazine clippings and whatnot. And at least as you traipse through the opening <laughs> dozen, three dozen, four dozen pages, you know, we have great images with, uh, you know, a local tractor driver was uh, quickly on the scene to pull us back on the road with a car lodged into the bushes, uh, another one upside down or backwards. Uh, 
obviously we know you became a phenomenal race car driver, championship winning race car driver, but it definitely seems like your formative years, Mr. Hobbs, were one where uh, the, uh, whether it was shrubs, embankments, or otherwise, helped educate you about track limits sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you always hear about track limits these days. Oh, we went over the yellow line. We went over the yellow line. Well, because, you know, the yellow line in those days was a, was a grass version, a ditch and a bush or whatever. And uh, there was virtually no runoff area at racetracks. And, of course, I had more than my fair share of running off the road as well. Um, but um, luckily, nothing ever life-threatening. And I... Even when I turned my dad's jag over at Alton Park, yeah, the first the first race of my second season, a gorgeous really XK one forty damage. <laughs> no, but it just it killed me to see that gorgeous XK one forty with you know fender wrinkled a you know uh, hood wrinkled a bit, you know windshield. <laughs> I mean, granted, all things that could be repaired, but uh, you obviously came from a loving family. That's all I'm saying because well, my and, father would have killed me. Me and the missus drove it home. <laughs> And on the way home, the hood opened, which actually did more damage than the crash. So, uh, wow. Yeah, I rang up Dad and said, uh, Dad, I've had a bit of a run for He said, I know. He said, I saw it on the television. <laughs> I said, what? He said, yeah, there was a news clip and they just happened to have your car, my car going over. He hmm. said, well, you broke it, you fix it. Uh, there you go. It never looked the same again, I can tell you that. So, as you have written and, and continue to write here about your early years, there, there's clearly talent on display. Uh, I also appreciate the fact, and I believe this was also fairly part and parcel of the times, uh, there was a progression to faster vehicles, but you certainly spent a decent amount of time learning in smaller, low-powered vehicles where extravagances of of drifting and uh you know using the throttle and other you know supercar type attributes they were not even possible because they didn't exist in a lot of the cars that you drove do you think there was an element of maturation in your driving skill and talent because you were you know you did spend a fair amount of time in small vehicles where you had to be precise and had to be intelligent uh, about making that speed well I suppose, you know, there's definitely an element of truth in there. Maybe if I jumped into a much bigger, faster car earlier on, my uh, misdemeanors might have had much more serious consequences. Um, you know, I mean, even the Lotus Elite, which, of course, was a beautiful-looking little mm. GT car and was a massive success in its day and was reckoned to be a pretty high-speed racer. I mean, the thing had an 1,100cc Coventry Climax engine, which gave like 85 horsepower. So, you know, you're not talking about a, a 900 horsepower McLaren here. But, of course, conversely, it had extremely narrow tires. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it didn't have much grip either. So you could still slide them around, even even uh, even even in those days, even without much power. And, uh, you know, my first two trips to the Nürburgring were with the Lotus Elite. Uh, first of all, I drove with my friend Bill Pinkney, and we won the class in 1961. And we not only won the class, we won. A, we were moved up to a bigger class because the car had Dad's automatic gearbox. And the next year, I went back with Richard Atwood and drove it again. And the next time I went to the Nurburgring, well, actually, the next time I went was in Sterling Moss's 904, which was not much better. But a year or two later, I went in John Surtees Lola T70. And that was just like going to a different circuit, yeah. you know, because you know, very the Nurburgring is very uh, up and you know, very up and hill and down dale. Um, not only is it windy, you know, 175 corners, but it's also extremely um, uh, up and down. And of course, on all the up bits, the elite was flat out. I'm taking all these corners flat out, feeling like uh, <laughs> feeling like some sort of hero. You get in a load of T70, and, oh shit, you know. We're going way too fast on this corner now. They've shortened uh, this track. It only takes half as long yeah, to get around yeah. it. They have shortened, shortened it by about three minutes. 
Well, again, we don't want to we don't want to give away every single thing in the you know in the book here and and go through every single chapter. But uh, there are just so many incredible gems here, David. Again, more than three hundred pages. Uh, the three hundred. Yes. Oh my God. I know. Like I said, your ego. It, it, it's okay. we always knew. We always knew this was coming. <laughs> you, you just you refused to let up on telling the world about your wonderful life. Uh, there's a lot left out too. Uh, well, you got to leave room for a part two. Well, you, there's well, what's the old See? saying? There's the book you write while you're alive, and the uh, the follow up for when you die. Um, <laughs> that you got to save all the all the bad stuff where you tell the world that folks like me and everyone else are horrible bastards. That's the part two. Um, <laughs> so we will look forward to so that. Much, but... um, you know, let's move up to 1962. You have a chapter titled Going International. And I found this to be equally as fascinating for the diversity uh, that was captured here, whether it was, you know, enjoying a Jaguar E type, uh, f- smaller formula cars as you're developing that side of your career. Uh, heading to good old America and Daytona, uh, meeting Bill France. It seems to me that, you know, of the many stops along the way in your career, it seems like this uh, going international portion is really one where uh, the road for you was cemented and also this very diverse uh, aspect of your career was cemented uh, with all the different cars and championships you'd eventually contest. Well, 1962, 61 was a watershed year for me because I finished my, I was, a, I was, I didn't go to college. I was an apprentice. I was an engineering apprentice at, at Jaguar Cars and I failed miserably at it. I, you know, you're supposed to go to technical college and come away with what's called a, a higher national certificate, which is a, a equivalent to a university degree. And uh, plus you have all the, um, you know, you have all the actual hands on work of working in a big factory in every department. And at the end of the year, um, we, I got married to Margaret, who I'd already been going out with then for seven years, and we got married in, in December. And I left, and Lofty England, who was the managing director of Jaguar at that time, and had been the team manager when they won Le Mans in 1955 and six, uh, he had become the managing director. He was a bit of a fan of mine. Um, and unlike the apprentice supervisor who didn't appreciate me at all Lofty England thought I had promised so he, he put me in a Jag owned by a chap called Peter Berry um, he had two Jags an E-Type and a, and a 3.8 Mark II saloon sedan and our very first event was the Daytona 3R um, which was the very first uh, Daytona sports car race and we came over and of course in those days you know you couldn't fly to to Florida from England, you had to fly to New York and then drive down. And there was no I-95, so he came down US-1. Um, and my companion was Peter Berry, who owned the car, and Jimmy Clark, yes, <laughs> who was driving my car. Colin Chapman was intrigued by my Elite, my Lotus Elite, which was Dad's automatic transmission. And when I say automatic, it was, it was fully automatic, but you could override it manually. And you, you just used the gear lever a bit like a sequential gear lever now you just put, and uh, we had modified the workings of the gearbox and it had a, it had a friction clutch it didn't have a fluid flywheel so it, it didn't use any power much well i love and david Colin I, chapman was intrigued by this. yeah and i mean with this lotus elite that he's produced yet the uh hobbs wizardry uh in putting yeah. that power to the ground i love the fact that uh the the car's designer and creator is fascinated by someone who's uh, improved it even further well, he was, and he wanted Jimmy Clark to drive it and see what he thought of it. Now, Jimmy, by this time, was in his Formula One car, and just prior to going to Daytona in uh, the end of January, uh, he had been on the Springbok series in South Africa and Rhodesia, uh, now Zimbabwe, and he had won two Formula One races there, um, beating Sterling Moss in Rob Walker's also loaded. Yeah. So I was pretty impressed with Jimmy. Anyway, we were all in the car and we drove down to Daytona. Now, there, uh, there's stopped. a phrase. Yeah, I was going to ask. You, you say that there was an American phrase that you were growing very tired of hearing on the drive down. 
Um, uh, uh, could you please share that with us? <laughs> yeah. Well, hands well, on the was, roof. Well, I was, <laughs> hey, guy, Paul, you didn't realize you were speeding down there. And put your hands on the roof, and old Jimmy Clark says, Well, the hell are they talking about? Put your hands on the roof. What's wrong with these guys? Don't they take your joke? Uh, so, anyway, we got there, and um, and as you say, met Bill France, of course, Jim and uh, Bill Jr. were just very, very young men then. And um, it was fascinating to see, you know, that slice of Americana with Bill France, this amazing bloody great speedway stuck there on the edge of Daytona which in those days was very small and um, compared to now and um, the, the speedway was well on the edge of town now it's more or less in town um, and you know he had those promotional attitudes and aspects about his life that you could see why he was going to be because he, he just wanted to internationalize Daytona International Speedway and he um, thought having a sports car race, and he had a terrific field. Sterling Moss, Walt Angsgen, uh, Fireball Roberts, Cale Yabra, um, Mark Donahue. I mean, practically anybody that was anybody in racing was in it, uh, including Jimmy Clark, uh, who the year after that would, of course, become world champion. Yeah. Um, so, no, maybe that was he world champion 62. Anyway, he was very close to being world champ. Yeah. So he had a great field. Um, and um, that's obviously how the Rolex 24 started. Uh, it was with Bill's foresight. He just wanted to put Daytona on the map. And, you, and, you know, you couldn't say that today he wasn't successful. I mean, the Daytona, the Rolex 24 is regarded around the world as really the beginning of the racing season. I mean, it's sort of the first race. And um, and it was fascinating to be there. And I stayed on for a week afterwards because he said, how do you guys, like, how do you boys like to drive a stock car in the 500? <laughs> so Jimmy and I thought that would be a good idea. So we both practiced in the Holman and Moody Galaxy. And we both turned in some pretty good speed. Um, but luckily, Dan Gurney, who had won 3R, was there and relieved us of that responsibility by driving the Holman movie car. <laughs> so, but I did stay and watch the race. What which did not did not go down particularly well at home because this is early February, end of January that I went to America and I'd only been married for six weeks. So that wasn't necessarily a great time to go off for my own, on my own for three weeks. Dear However, Mags was being introduced to the stresses of being married she, to a race car driver. She's still here, so I guess. <laughs> and what did you uh, what did you think, David, of this uniquely American discipline of climbing in large, heavy uh, sedans and pounding around a giant oval? Obviously, you'd used uh, fair you know fair portion of the oval for the uh, the sports car race, but actually being stuck up on the big banking, did you take to it? Did you enjoy it? Uh, I can't say I did terribly because those stock cars in those days were pretty flexible flyers um, and uh, I mean of course I'd, I'd never been 150 miles an hour in a straight line before and here I was I averaged like 151 or something around the track wow. uh, I was only about 3 or 4 or 5 miles an hour shy of the pole uh, and it was the first time I'd ever been 150 and of course the steering good lord you could do a quarter of a turn either way on the steering wheel and nothing happened Um so I found that a bit uh, <laughs> a bit off-putting, but generally speaking, uh, yeah, I mean, well, I didn't drive a stock car again until 1976, so I probably, I don't know, what, should I have done more of it? I mean, obviously, if we'd known then what we know now, that NASCAR was going to kind of take over the world of racing, um, it might have been better to try and get your feet under the table, but... And again, Bill France always liked to have, you know, you had Vic Elford, Jackie Oliver, myself, uh, the Frenchman, uh, what's his name, the very tall French guy, he did quite a few NASCAR races over the years. Um, so he liked, he, he liked the idea of having an international guy there. Now his, uh, his uh, tech guy, Bill, uh, Gla oh, what's his name, Gla not Glazenby, but something like that, he wasn't keen on Europeans at all. Hmm. You, you, what you European doing over here taking our money? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, Bill, but I'm here. <laughs> well, there's 
there's a lovely transition here into uh, using Formula Junior uh, as a real springboard to capture uh, wider attention for your talents. Obviously, you and, and Richard uh, Attenborough were, uh, you know, doing some wonderful things along with some other young drivers. The knowing, you know, that will certainly, uh, as folks will read, serve so much of what uh, develops in your career. The the thing that sticks out to me, you know, as we're getting a little bit further into the book, as you know, sports car racing has been a passion of mine forever. As a reporter and journalist and whatnot, uh, I've been fortunate to cover it uh, ten times in person. Very romantic uh, notions of what it was like, you know, whether it's uh, Steve McQueen, the movie Le Mans, uh, the just gorgeous 1960s and 70s era of Le Mans. And then I get to what might be my favorite paragraph written by you in the book that absolutely dispelled any notion of romance at Le Mans, talking about when you were uh, racing the uh, Lola Mark VI you have a wonderful little passage here. The paddock was terrible back then, and the lavatories were grotesque, with an unforgettably appalling smell. In charge of them was a toothless old crone who sat literally at the door of the men's facilities, doing her knitting. Everyone had to give a franc to pass, but I doubt whether she ever actually went inside, judging by the state of the place. She was there for years. So uh, this romantic notion I had of Le Mans back in the, this era, David, uh, you've helped correct a little bit of that. What? Uh, obviously, you drove some amazing cars there, uh, but it's safe to say that maybe the, uh, the literal facilities were lacking. But that's what made it so romantic, Marshall, that sort of that earthy kind of uh, nature, you know, you run what you brung, and uh, <laughs> you go to the <laughs> go to the lounge. Yeah. The old girl looking on while she's doing anything. No, uh, I loved Le Mans. It's the race. It was when I was a kid. It was the race that I wanted to do more than any. It's the race I wanted to win more than any, and I still would have liked to have won Le Mans. Um, uh, and I think it still does have a tremendous allure. There's just something about it uh, and Daytona for all the efforts of the France family and, and everything you know the Daytona 24 hour race is just not Le Mans the track itself is so wonderful I mean English, the French countryside at night and, and in daylight and in the dawn and the dusk and the day is so long because it's been you know, the longest weekend of the year so you had lovely, love, lovely long days, great long straights, sweeping curves. Um, it was a fantastic place to race, and my still is my really my favourite race to go to. I went there for many years with you know ESPN and then Speed, um, and before that I went with ESPN again. <laughs> and so I've I've loved them. I always have, in spite of the toilets, um, and they are a bit better now. Uh, it's still not great, um, but it's you know it's all been modernised. It's got a great big um, press box. The whole thing is is very much more up to date. I don't, I don't particularly like the new shape. A lot of the new corners. I thought the old track was just absolutely fine. And going over the Dunlop Bridge, under the Dunlop Bridge, over the top of the hill there at sort of five o'clock in the morning, the sun just coming up going down into the Dunlop curves and you couldn't see them because it, you, the sun was right in your eyes as you went over the top of the hill and at the bottom of the hill were the curves and of course they were still it was still dark down there you never knew whether there were sunglasses or a visor or what because you knew that as soon as you got halfway down the hill the sun would suddenly go behind the trees again and now you, now you didn't want your sunglasses on mm. um, so it presented lots of challenges and of course that long long straight which when I first went there, barely had any guardrail, you know, a few stretches of guardrail. Um, otherwise, um, the whole place was pretty bereft of any safety features. Um, but still in all, you know, it, it was it was a great place. Um, and of course, you're surrounded by Frenchmen who who want to be awkward and on, on purpose and make life difficult for you, and all that was all part of the challenge and part of the romance. Just wonderful. I... Take me back. I appreciate the fact, David, that around this time as well, I mean, you are obviously uh, fully invested in this path in life. Uh, tell us about the, the process 
or maybe the recognition of, uh, in, as a motor racing driver, the transition from, I guess, apprentice per se, someone who is learning, not at that place quite yet of being paid, to the paying oppor- the opportunities that are now paying those who are saying come to this event and drive for us because you've you're reaching a point in your career which again you document uh, extensively where uh, you have learned you have demonstrated you have proven your ability and folks are paying attention and are uh, ringing you up and hiring you to work for them what was that process like though because not everybody makes that transition well in those days Again, you know, if you showed any sort of talent in your car, you know, people would be coming up to ask you, would you like to drive my Morgan or my Lotus Lead or my MGB or whatever um, at, at Thruxton next week? And, you know, I'll pay you 20 quid or 30 quid to drive it. What do you think? And you'd say, obviously, yeah. Um, and we did reach a point, well, in 1963, well, 1962 was my first paying year because Castrol and Peter Berry paid me to drive the Jaguars. You know, not a lot by modern standards at all, but, I mean, it was money, and I did have a Castrol contract. Um, and I was starting to get things like tyres free for my car, which was, you know, or at a very, very highly discounted rate. So I'd always had a bit of money coming in. Um, and then in 63, I drove for Midland Racing Partnership in the Formula Junior with Richard Atwood and Bill Bradley. And they paid me £25 a race to race it. And I made about £900 racing racing that year. And I made about 900 working for my dad wow. at the factory. And then at the end of the year, after the Ford debark and they let us down and they didn't use the gearbox, then dad's company went under. So... Margaret and I are now faced with a choice. We've got uh, we've got one little boy, Craig, who's like now 18 months, and we've got another one on the way. And we sat around our dining room table at Blacklow Road and um, and had a real heart to heart. You know, do you do you think I should sort of tail between my legs, go back to Jack, and see if I get a job there? Well, they'll probably just laugh at me, but I could try. Um, or should I get a job? You know, selling mops or doing something. Uh, or should we try and make a, a go of being a professional driver and not do anything else? And, to, you know, I mean, this is the thing that gets me as Margaret to my, not to my astonishment then, because, you know, we'd been together already for over 10 years then. Um, you know, we agreed that maybe I should try to make the racing go. And um, so at the end of 63, uh, we said, OK, we're going to be a professional driver in 1974. And I got to drive with Team Lotus in their Lotus Cortinas. Um, I got to drive for Tim Parnell because Midland Racing Partnership decided to let me go and take on Tony Max, the Rhodesian driver, yeah. who had some Formula One experience. Um, and so, you know, I had drives here and a bit of a drive there. And, uh, and that's sort of how it went. And, um, and you just try and get as much money as you could per per you know per person to drive it. Always trying to get money out of Esso or Shell or BP. They were they were the big sponsors of racing in those days. And um, you know, trying to get fifty quid here or fifty quid there. And um, and that's basically you know what I did then for the next twenty eight years. Um, and you look for every drive, and that's why people like myself and Richard and um, Sterling and of course Mario being the absolute prime example you drove anything because you drove anything as long as people would pay you for it um, and um, that's how you did it I mean if somebody wanted to have you exclusively they'd have to pay you a lot of money um, and then it, it went on like that in 65 I had quite a good year in that Lola T70 yeah and absolutely course, in the 68 and 69 I drove the Golf GT40s which was you know my best paydays ever but I mean, you know, to put things in perspective, they paid seven hundred and fifty per race, and they paid a thousand dollars for the long ones, Daytona, Sebring, and Le Mans. So you know, you're looking at a thousand dollars, you know, which we thought was good money because uh, they they paid all your expenses as well. But even so, it, you know, compared to well, at least.
least we didn't have to pay for it like you do now. So, um, well, I'm just, uh, just, I'm not laughing. I'm laughing just at the absurdity of, uh, you know, with hindsight, had they offered you a contract that said we'll either pay you a thousand dollars to drive the car at Le Mans, or you can just keep it after the race. Um, I, <laughs> uh, you would be speaking to me from uh, your golden palace, uh, having sold that GT40 for all it's worth today, but. Uh, Good Lord, just considering all the risks that were involved, uh, and you know, we know how treacherous some of those events were. Uh, once we started getting high speed cars like the GT40, uh, that $1,000 is just uh, it's a fascinating sum for uh, the risks involved. As we look at uh, more of Hobbo, David, uh, I love some of the crazy little notes, and this is where I think readers will really appreciate uh, your book, because this is not, frankly, a tale of I had a wonderful career driving for Manufacture X. I did that for 30 years. I want everything in the world. Aren't I fabulous? The end. This is very much... A, a highly detailed, and you know, I drove this here. I went that to this thing there. There's immense detail in how much movement uh, was done uh, in your driving career, uh, big and small. And also, I think the to use the word diversity again. You know, driving a BRM power, powered M2 prototype at Le Mans, the, the minutia of some of the uh, glorious things you've driven, even though some of them were never going to win. I appreciate that aspect of your book as well, David, because it really seems like you said, if I'm going to write an autobiography, I don't want it just to be highlights. I really want it to encapsulate as much as possible. Well, I've always been self-deprecating in my, any, anytime I speak or whatever, you know, um, I've tried not to be a blowhard and you know my racing career was okay um, but I mean I didn't achieve anything like what I really wanted to achieve I okay I achieved a lot more than some people and even more to the point having raced from 1959 to 1990 I'm still here um, and not only am I still here but I didn't get hurt um, in any meaningful way of course, to my best friend Brian Redman says, "Well, you obviously weren't going fast." <laughs> uh, <laughs> always, always a good supporter. Um, and anyway, so and and it again, you know, when you start talking to the tape recorder, you know, you remember these things. You, you, your stuff starts to come out. And then when I read it, you know, I, I thought, "Oh my God, that's right." Yeah, Nurburgring. We didn't just do that. We did this and that. We went here and we went there. And those sort of things come back to you, and um, we we all we all did have a pretty diverse career. I suppose I had slightly more diverse, probably because I didn't get enough really good drives, and I had to sort of clutch at straws. And so I ended up just just about driving anything with four wheels. About the only thing I didn't drive on was dirt, and um, which you know, again looking back would have been probably quite fun, I think, to drive on dirt. Um, again, dangerous as hell. Uh, but, um, you know, a lot of people have lived to tell the tale. But So, yeah, I had a very diverse career, and I drove some great cars. I drove some dreadful cars. But I did drive some... I drove practically every major car that is now regarded as a absolutely super car of the 60s and 70s. I drove one. Um, if you could add together some of the cars I drove, I mean, collectively, they'd be worth a couple of hundred million bucks. Yeah. And that's... You know, 9, 917, GT40s, Penske 512, Ferrari, uh, BMW, just something like a BMW 3-litre CSL. You know, I mean, those everything I drove now suddenly, <laughs> it's just, I drove some real classics. Well, let's just close with this. Formula One driver, Trans Am, Can Am, IMSA, uh, both GT and GTP, Group 7, uh, Formula Junior, Formula 2, Formula 5000. 
I mean, Indy 500, Le Mans, Daytona, uh, your everything that you have driven and the places you have driven, David, they, they genuinely represent a person's complete wish list. Uh, if you were to go back in time and say, where would I want to race and what would I want to race, as you mentioned, you happen to be the guy <laughs> who has done every single one of those things. And then we close in the book. Uh, with 40 years in television and uh, that I didn't want to get into um, here because I think that is just a, a true possibly unexpected gem for some who know you as a driver but uh, weren't aware that you're going to dedicate so much time to your broadcast career uh, your, your home and friends and family and whatnot and then because you're a good husband as we uh, get ready to say farewell here the uh, the final words in the book, not your own. Uh, you saved uh, the afterward for dear Margaret Hobbs. So uh, I thought that was just a beautiful gesture, knowing that your dear wife uh, has been uh, a, a true companion, your co-pilot per se, uh, throughout this amazing career of yours uh, that you've encapsulated in your autobiography. So the, I. This might sound silly, but thank you for writing it, because there are a lot of autobiographies that I pass on quickly and or are propping up uh, wobbly desks and such, and uh, yours is truly, truly fascinating. Well, mine is already propping up Sam Posey's desk. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, well, well... That's very kind of you. That's very kind of you, Marshall. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, Well, we thought it was appropriate that Max had the last word, and... Uh, I see has been a staunch supporter. I mean, I've been going out with her four years before I even started racing. And so she has seen it all from, you know, right through the entire spectrum of my life. So uh, it was only fitting that she should have her chapter and her final say. And um, so uh, and I appreciate you uh, saying nice things about the book. I, I really do appreciate it coming from you. That means a lot to me. And um I appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed for having me on here for 45 minutes. And that was Dear Mr. Hobbs. Again, uh, I'm of all the books I'm staring at right now on my in my four book shelves, there are a lot of autobiographies contained within those shelves. And David's, while it is the newest, I would say quality-wise, the depth and uh, just the storytelling within it, uh, easily, easily surpassed almost everything that I already have in my collection. So, uh, granted, I wish he was paying me to say all these nice things, but nonetheless, he's a great friend, and uh, he's done a great thing here with this book. So, if you're a fan of motor racing books and autobiographies, which we know that those are uh, coming out uh, fewer and farther between, this is definitely one that, if you're a fan like me, and you pay for all your books, I pay for all of them. Uh, this is one to definitely save up your money and consider. All right, this is Marshall Pruitt. This is the 300th episode of the Marshall Pruitt Podcast presented by Cooper Tires, which is kind of a crazy thing for me to consider. Thank you for listening. 